In this video lecture, we're going to solve the heat equation with a generation term for a plane wall system. Specifically, this problem states, solve for the temperature profile and the flux profile for a plane wall at steady state with constant thermal conductivity and with a generation term. In the past, we have solved for the plane wall system with all of those conditions, except it also had no generation. And when we integrated the heat equation, we found that the temperature profile was just a straight line. That straight line of temperature implies that our flux through the whole system is constant. So if we were to graph our flux with respect to x, we would see that it's just constant. Again, that's only if there's no generation term. So what happens if there is a generation term? Does this change? Let's first start by looking at the heat equation. So we see that this is, system is at steady state, so there's no accumulation term. Because this is a plane wall, we expect temperature only to vary in the x direction and not in the y or z direction. So because temperature doesn't vary in the y direction, the derivative of temperature with y is zero. Same with z. So we're left with this temperature variation in x direction and this generation term. Because we have a constant thermal conductivity, we can pull thermal conductivity out. And because we have temperature varying with only one other variable, we get normal derivatives instead of partial derivatives. So our heat equation ends up looking like this in these particular circumstances. So K times the second derivative of temperature with respect to X plus Q dot equals zero. So this is the form of the heat equation that we're trying to solve after we've made simplifying assumptions. So it would be convenient here to rearrange this a little bit. We want to lump our constants together. So K and Q dot are constants. And it's gonna be helpful to separate and integrate if we put those constants on the right hand side. So doing that rearrangement, we get the second derivative of temperature with respect to x squared is equal to minus q dot over k. So let's go ahead and separate and integrate. If we multiplied both sides by uh, dx, we would end up with the derivative of the first derivative of temperature with respect to x is equal to minus q dot over k times dx. We go ahead and integrate both sides and we end up with dt dx is equal to minus q dot over k times x. And we also pick up a constant of integration. It's helpful to consider our boundary conditions at this point. If we have a flux boundary condition, that's easier to apply at this stage of the integration when we have the equation in dt dx form. However, we have two surface temperature boundary conditions, so it won't do us much good to consider boundary conditions at this point. We'll want to integrate once more before we do that. So here's the, our equation in its current state. Let's go ahead and separate again. So we get, we multiply both sides by dx. We get t, dt is equal to minus q dot over k times x dx, and we also get plus c1 dx. So when we integrate again, we'll just integrate that whole side, we end up with our temperature is equal to minus q dot over k times the integral of x, which is x squared over two, plus C1 times X, when we pick up a second constant of integration. And that's consistent. We know that the heat equation with respect to one dimension like X is a second order differential equation. So for each spatial coordinate, we're going to need two boundary conditions. And we having those two boundary conditions will help us to solve for these two different constants of integration. Okay, so this is the generic form of our equation but we don't know what C1 is or C2. So now is when we would apply the boundary conditions. So here at x equals zero, we have our temperature is equal to TS1. So I'm gonna substitute TS1 in for temperature, and I'm going to substitute zero in for x. So 
this term is going to be zeroed out and this term is going to be zeroed out and we'll get that TS1 is just equal to the constant C2. So that one was easy. So that we got that by saying at x equals 0, t equals ts1. So let's look at our other boundary condition, and I'll try and do this on the same page. At x equals l, we have t is equal to ts2. So this one gets a little, a little hairier in terms of algebra. So we're going to go ahead and uh, substitute in L for X and TS2 for T. So we get our temperature is equal to minus Q dot times L squared over 2 times K. And this is TS2 because we've made that substitution plus C1 times L, this term. And then we still have plus C2, but let's just forget about C2 because we already know that it's equal to TS1. So we don't have to worry about C2 any longer. Okay, so now we have one equation, one unknown. We just want to solve for C1 under these particular conditions. And now I am going to skip on to another slide to give myself more room here. So we end up with rearranging this equation. I'm going to skip through some of the algebra, but if you want to pause and work through this on your own, by all means, go for it. So we get that our C1 is equal to TS2 minus TS1 over L. plus q dot times l over 2k. So now what we want to do is we want to take uh, our known definition for C1 and just plug it in here. So doing that, we get our temperature as a function of x is equal to minus q dot times x squared over 2k plus Here's where our C1 goes in, TS2 minus TS1 over L plus Q dot times L over 2K. And then we're going to take both of those terms and multiply them by K, oh, by X. And then we're going to add our other constant, which is TS1. Okay, so that's how our equation looks. So this, we could rearrange it and make it a, a little cleaner. To be honest with you, it doesn't get all that much cleaner. So this is our temperature profile. This is how it looks. So that's the solution. So you do see that we have an x squared term in there. So though the temperature profile depends on um, x squared. It also depends on x and then it has a constant there, a constant intercept. So now if we wanted to um, figure out what the flux term is. The other thing we were asked, how do we get that? So if you remember, we just apply Fourier's law here. We know the temperature profile, and Fourier's law states that the flux in the x direction is equal to minus k times dt dx. And really it would be the gradient, but we know that there's no temperature variation in the y or z direction, so we're just dealing with this one dimension here. Okay. So now we know our temperature profile. We can just differentiate our temperature profile. So this term, we differentiate that term, and we end up with um, minus 2 times q dot times x over 2 times k. So our 2s would cancel out there. So that's the derivative of this first term. The derivative of the second term with respect to x is quite simple. It's just this um, multiplier in front of the x. So we have ts2 minus ts1 over l plus 
q dot times l over 2k. And then there, the derivative of a constant is just 0. So here's our, our um, derivative with respect to x. And so our flux, we just need to take that whole term and multiply it by minus k. So I'm going to cheat, and I'm just going to do this. So our flux in the x direction as a function of x is equal to this. So let's take a look. So I took the liberty of graphing both of these equations in Excel. So let's just think through how we think this is going to look. I, we answered the question, so before, when we had no generation, we got just a straight line, and our flux through the whole system was just constant. Now we're seeing that our temperature profile is a quadratic, so we expect to see some curvature there. If you recall, well, we'll get to that. Okay, so under these particular circumstances, so I went in and plugged in some of the constants, um, well, all of the constants here, so that we could just plot this. I did this in Excel. So we have our generation term of 20,000 watts per cubic meter. So how does that actually look in terms of our temperature profile if we plot it? So a temperature as a function of x looks like this. So you see it's important to verify if we got the equation right that we actually go through our boundary conditions. And you can see we do end up at 100 degrees on the left and 40 degrees on the right. What's happening in this system is that if our plane wall is between here and here, remember we have that generation term in there. So energy is being generated uniformly throughout. So this thing is generating, that heat has got to get out. It's got to get out of our system. So it's going to leave our system here at the edges and that may be leaving by convection or by radiation. We don't really know or care that much, frankly. We have energy leaving here somehow. But because it's being generated, generated uniformly throughout, it's got to travel all the way through our solid. So if we have, if we took a little section of our solid and we had energy being generated here, well, on, on, in aggregate, that heat needs a temperature gradient for it to leave by conduction. So you see this temperature gradient form so that heat can flow out of our system. What happens here at the top is there is no temperature gradient or the temperature gradient is zero. So energy is not going it's just sort of, I guess it's going both directions really, but it's leaving both at the same rate. Um, and right at the very center, the, f the net flux would actually be zero. But because this temperature is higher on the left, that creates this shallower slope. So energy is not leaving quite as fast from the left as it is from the right. The right's being maintained at a lower temperature, so that creates a higher slope, and remember that dt dx is the driving force for heat transfer and conduction, so we would expect to see a higher flux. If we plot our flux equation, we see that we took the derivative of a quadratic, and so we get a line. So looking at flux with respect to x, we see that flux changes um, linearly. So we definitely do see, because of this highest slope on the right side, we also see the greatest flux on the right side. So we see a flux of up to about 2300 watts per meter squared right at the edge. And on the left hand side we actually see that the flux is negative. So what negative flux means is that heat is going against our coordinate system. So heat is going this way when flux is negative and it's going this way when flux is positive. And you can see that break-even point. I mentioned that here, where there's this point of symmetry and dt dx is zero, there's no net driving force for heat transfer, so there's no flux if you measured it right there. But immediately to the right, you see a positive and increasing flux. So we're getting more and more energy leaving the system. And then to the left, you see a negative and decreasing flux, meaning that, I mean, I guess, if you think in absolute terms, you'd actually see more and more flux leaving the system the closer you get as that slope increases. So the reason this happens in a generating system, notice that when there's no generation, the flow of heat is constant as a function of x. Well, when you are generating, if you're traveling from one spot to another spot, 
you see that the further you go, the more and more generation you encounter. So as you travel along, you're encountering more and more generation, which means there's more and more energy that needs to escape. So in this particular case, the flux is not constant, but it actually varies linearly. Okay, let's think. Um, another thing mathematically to note is that before we started our integration, our heat equation looked like this. The second derivative of temperature with respect to x was equal to minus q dot over k. Because q dot is positive, this term on the right stays negative. So if the second derivative is negative, that implies that our function is going to be concave like that. So what if we looked at a different system, and now let's say instead of a generation term, we have this consumption term. Let's say that our wall is being cooled uniformly rather than heated. So that uh, concavity flips and you actually end up with a convex temperature profile, where now the heat here we're actually dipping to below, um, below zero, and now we have energy actually flowing into our system from both sides, and there's more energy flowing in from the left because of that higher temperature creates a higher driving force, and our inflex inflection point is slightly skewed to the right. So if we looked at that, so this confirms, so if you notice to the left of our inflection point we have a positive flow of energy, which means energy is flowing with our coordinate system, and then to the right of that inflection point we see where this flux goes below zero, so we have a negative flow of energy, which means energy is flowing against our coordinate system. And because the system is sort of consuming energy, uh, as you travel through it, you see that it just energy comes in and it just kind of gets absorbed eventually by whatever is causing that. It could be some kind of refrigeration system. Um, it could be some kind of a, an endothermic chemical reaction in solid state, something like that. OK, and finally, I want you to stop and think. So if we, we saw that when you have um, when you have the second derivative of temperature is negative, we get a concave function. When the second derivative with respect to temperature is positive, so we had, um, let's just call this a positive. Remember it was minus q dot over k, but q dot itself is negative, so that makes the term positive. Then we get a convex looking function. So what is it if there's, if the generation term is zero? I probably gave this away earlier in the lecture, but you would see, again, this defaults back to our line of constant slope. We'd end up with that basic form of the heat equation with no, with no generation. And we, again, we see that our temperature with respect to x is linear, which means that our flux through the system is constant. And because our temperature is decreasing as you go from left to right, that creates this driving force. Energy flows downhill, and that results in our flux being positive throughout, meaning that energy is flowing with our coordinate system. So it's interesting to see how the math sort of verifies what we would think through conceptually, and it, and it helps us to better understand conceptually what's going on, and vice versa.